kind of came to my mind looking and listening to you what Tarkovsky always said, how important it is to actually um, kind of avoid that traditions and rituals disappear and how we can bring back rituals and traditions maybe uh, in, a new, in a new way. And that leads us right away to our next speaker and her research, um, Katya Novitskova. Um, she's researching evolutionary transformations of matter, social, and also informational processes. Her background is in visual semiotics, also in graphic design and in new media. She's often used artist publication also for her work, like extraordinary artist books, of which many have actually to do with the topic of extinction. They're almost like encyclopedias of extinction. Uh, and as mentioned earlier today, we are very delighted to present a series of sculptures by Katya, which are located in the back here. So when you have time later today to explore the space and also find all the posters and manifestos on the table, you hopefully will also have time to see uh, Katya's sculpture. She will be presenting also a talk today which expands her interest in the relationship between the nature of contemporary visual forms as they are disseminated online and also their ancient kind of uh, origins. So uh, in a way, um, it connects the future, the present, and the past. The lecture is called Never-Ending Story, Patterns of Survival and Expansion Curves. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Katya Noviskova. Hello. Is that the right mic? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Katya. Um, I am an art I'm a visual artist. Um, I make sculptures, uh, installations, and publications. And my publications are kind of a source, source material and sort of <clears throat> little manifesto practice that I then expand into my physical work. Um, I want to, today I'll, have, I'll give you sort of a crazy, fast walkthrough uh, through my thinking in relation to the marathon. Um, so please bear with me if it's a bit too unclear and fast and crazy. Um, so yeah, I, we start of course with the Big Bang and this idea that uh, everything around us is in a way uh, matter and giving birth to itself, cannibal cannibalizing on itself and um, you know, mate mating with itself for millennia in an exponential kind of curve. Um, and in that way, um, the way we can think about everything around us and ourselves uh, is in a, with the word of form. We're just sort of forms, temporary forms of the matter of the universe that is constantly, constantly changing. And we're just sort of this little sprinkles of life in it and we are constantly changing and the sort of the entropy and the decay and and the sort of the birth and the growth and all these things that are kind of happening in and out all the time on the scale of mountains on the scale of cute little girls on the scale of blue whales on the scale of ipads and and art in this conference um, and what lately has been also added and what has been kind of maybe expanding our idea of what a reality can be is this sort of digital layer on everything that we acquired in the last, in the last sort of decades. And, and that kind of started to liquefy the, 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 you know, the physical, the reality of, uh, of matter. Uh, it, with this mentality of software, that things are changeable, things have algorithms, things have kind of, um, uh, they are not set in stone, even stones in a way are, is a changing, flexible thing. And um, I've been, in my work, I've mostly worked with this kind of assemblage-based practice of uh, mixing things um, which are sort of were unmixable before you got Photoshop and before you got digital technologies where you can actually, you know, attach, on, at least on the image, you can attach a dinosaur or a corpse of an animal. And you can also do that in, in real life in a way by um, attaching a microchip on a living cell. 
uh, and I've been looking into this kind of interfaces between biology and technology for a while. Uh, and this idea of, um, for instance, eyes in relation to cameras, in, in relation to our identities. Um, and how is that, for instance, one of the sort of the driving elements of, you know, humanity? And you're all looking at me and I look at you and this sort of this visual experience. And another thing is the brain itself and it's sort of, um, again, towards a kind of a more, uh, the brain that is no longer a mystery, but the brain that is, can, can be activated, manipulated, explored in a very physical way of like neurochemistry. Um, and it all comes down into the most extreme and banal kind of reality of, of um, the internet, the visual culture around us, which is digitized or goes through the digital sort of highways and basically um, that is driven by eyes and, and, and emotions of billions of people. And the sort of the mammoth infrastructure of the internet with all the wireless and with all the everything around it that is sort of fueled by our physical attention, the calories that we actually spend watching the screens and making, taking pictures and you know putting filters on them. And it's sort of a, big industry and it's a place of dispute, our sort of attention zones. And, uh, and the attention is something again, extremely, extremely ancient. And that it's, it is sort of, it comes, um, you know, it starts as soon basically as life starts. And we, since we are sort of primate, primates and all that, we have a very specific kind of set of pre, Pre, uh, pre-recorded maybe reactions or gateways to how we see the reality and what we react to. And, um, and it's been also changing in many, many different ways. Uh, you know, we've been, uh, we've been uh, the color, even the fact of color vision has been switching from like two, two colors, four colors, really depends on kind of where you sit on the evolutionary tree. And we ended up with like kind of not very good Three color vision, so like uh, um, fish and rep reptiles and birds, they have better vision than us, and they see more things. But this is what we got, and mostly we needed like the color vision to see fruits, to see that they're ripe, to see each other, to kind of get attracted to each other, and in that sense, um, I can I can I can sort of. Uh, consider the contemporary visual culture as a continuation of these fruits that we were, were supposed to look at in the first place. And sort of you can think of an image as a kind of visual intensity that is grabbing our attention, whatever the medium, it can be a drawing. And these days it's just um, bits you know, projected um, from the screen on you in sort of form of light waves that you recognize as visual patterns. Um, but uh, yeah, this is somehow this, this kind of our in, like predisposition to reacting to images, to reacting to certain you know, things in them. And obviously one of the most ancient elements of what we react to in the most strong way is animals. And more and more there's a sort of a very strange um, kind of collision course between technological objects that we develop as like gadgets and devices and <clears throat> and sort of existing animal uh, animal uh, animalistic forms that have been developing by themselves for millions and millions of years and internet is one of the funny places where they sort of combined because uh, uh, because statistically kind of if you look at it a lot of traffic on the internet is driven by pictures of cute animals, cute babies, uh, or scary animals and scary babies, but uh, there's a sort of a very strong, um, uh, there's a very strong attractor in those things. And, and there's a something, um, you know, this, it gets to a point where there's more images of, you know, Asian tigers than there are Asian tigers in, in left in the wild, so it gets it, the image, also the digital image becomes this kind of little formal pa pattern parasite, but also an add-on to the actual uh, animal and the actual 
sort of nature and in the way it will ex it will ex exist way longer maybe than the actual animal that will maybe eventually die out like for instance the Asian tiger but I have the penguins as an example of my work um, and there's a sort of this uh, the the animal form is also a lot about the sort of the the kind of the advanced patterns that evolved in in the in the universe in a way that we are making use of to get somebody's attention. So you always see animal forms in marketing, in in movies, in art as one of the main tropes. And it's basically uh, my thesis is that it also just comes from this visual strength of the pattern of the animal. And we kind of it's not really about the animal itself anymore. For uh, for me, this is like an abstract art almost in a way that I just hijack a sort of animalistic pattern in the real life and then use it in my work uh, to get attention of people, to get attention of the art uh, viewing persons and to kind of activate their brains towards a sort of positive response, which ends up actually working uh, almost uh, like a clock in a sense. There's, it's always interesting to see this dynamic of people just taking out their phone, snapping the fo snapping the sculpture as like a almost subconscious instinct, and I call this kind of um, this way of understanding um, images and uh, and kind of the world as you know as it, as being surrounded by um, patterns which activate us in one or the other way, and this and what is somehow unique as well about now is with this. Um, huge traffic of animal patterns on the internet is that um, they're more and more not animal, not just nature. It's always, always, always mixed with technology, mixed with our human environments. It doesn't even exist in this pure form anymore. So I just, these are just YouTube videos that I find and I list them as this kind of intensities of, of um, patterns that are attention grabbing. And some of them are, I will read it to you, beluga whale talking, chameleon on the phone. And so these kind of assemblages, I almost see them as the sort of predict, they have this, they have this attention grabbing power, but they also have this prediction power of where sort of the nature of things will move towards. It will never be any more a pristine forest with nothing there. If there is a picture of a forest, there was, an eye, there was a camera in the forest. So the technology is always present. And this, uh, obviously, this is just a little slide about the comparison of um, in extinction events. Um, if they say this, one of the biggest extinctions from like several hundred million years ago was caused by gamma rays from space, then this extinction is caused by us, um, you know, uh, consuming and having lots of iPhones and computers and cars and and just basically being this humongous parasitic species. And um, the rate of extinction of biological species these days is kind of suspiciously coinciding with the expansions of human species and human technology. And it's almost like this, um, it, it's like one-on-one -on -one correlation. I don't know how to call this statistically, but it looks, it looks impressive. So I started to work with these curves of expansion of economical expansion and also curves of extinctions and curves of that's you know kind of illustrate the the broader processes in the world and uh, and besides of course what what's happening now uh, we've had tons of really really big extinctions and there's always this sort of the the curve is always going up and down up and down and there's this moment of mass extinction followed by a moment of massive expansion of new forms and then in, in again in the in the sense of like form creation form form uh, the birth of form and the potentialities of forms the sort of the extinctions are always are always followed by something new and therefore uh, somehow it's it's never it's never an apocalypse it's always just a mini apocalypse for for specific species for us for specific human beings, for like sort of in the, in a kind of a banal way, life always finds a way. It's a Jurassic Park quote, of course. Um, so yeah, so the 
in my kind of basically my intuitive thesis is that the the expansion of future animal forms will be really related closely to the element of attention and human beings looking at these animals and looking at these beings. So the image, uh, the future animal, the future nature, and the future image are like related um, physically, and they are sort of um, how do you call, joint in the hip, as they say. And this is just a little curve of like emerging technology hype cycle from this year from Economist, and this idea of basically. Uh, you know, bubbles and bursts um, that are then illustrated on the kind of very neutral uh, curve of the statistical curve is something um, chilling, but it's also in a sense, it is how things work. <laughs> and I, I'm sort of into the poetic side of it more than um, uh, kind of, I'm not really trying to find a solution. Um, another kind of curve is this in invasion curve, globalization curve of different species uh, that is sort of happening. Uh, again, a very aesthetic, aesthetic confrontation of different forms caused partly by human beings, partly by sort of the, the species themselves. This is another future, future scenario of a seal with a kind of attached computer chip. GPS situation, um, and ultimately, uh, the the kind of the curve of expansion and the curve of extinction. Uh, there is a there is a there is a sort of an idea that there's a you know of a limit to, to growth, and then at certain point, uh, things will collapse and. Um, we will cannibalize the Earth. Will cannibalize itself uh, through us, and the, there will be mass extinction, and we will all fight for f for water, and you know it will be this post-apocalyptic scenario. And there's only one way out of it. If you look in 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 this continuation of expansion, and it's the way out through um, going outside of planet Earth and kind of exploring the resources. Um, outside of it, which is basically asteroids and Mars and things like that. And it's, it's kind of, it's actually now, because there's such a desperation to kind of imagine the continuation of growth, that um, this, is a, this is a serious proposition these days, and there's tons of companies and governments that are actually working on this uh, idea. Um, and ultimately, um, kind of, uh, with landing us on Mars, on this desert where, every, where if there ever was life, it died out long time ago, and somehow this potentiality of a new desert, as the as the sort of the only way out, is kind of interesting. And and the way, uh, the way it brings us back to the images is that anything we know about Mars is just from pictures that a robot, uh, that a bunch of robots are taking on it right now and they're just sort of driving around and they have a kind of high definition little photo cameras that they are, um, that they are snapping all this insane amount of beautiful images and they're sending it to Earth. And the fact that there is a planet and they are already sort of inhabited by robots um, and that we are almost like in this friendly relationship already with it is, is one of this bizarre kind of outcomes that we're seeing right now. Um, this is Curiosity. This is this robot that is taking most recent pictures. And um, he's sort of kindly, re weirdly reminds me of dinosaurs and like early life forms and the way he's roaming the planet doing whatever kind of he wants or the whatever. He has even degree of artificial intelligence because he has to navigate the space. And this is a model of a, um, of a, a European Space Agency robot testing testing ground, and it's just like a basically it looks like an exhibition. Um, it's this some photo studio where this thing is crawling around, and again this this sort of layering of images upon images upon images. Then all we the all, the only way we know about these things is also through image. So it's it sort of becomes this. Um, the, the sort of never-ending re relationship from image into object back into image and, and sort of uh, 
in the way of the narrative creation. This is a picture taken by on Mars as well. Um, this is um, this is like uh, kind of the the sort of the, the the insane amount of images from Mars now generates insane amount of conspiracy theories. And again, we go back to this animal form being recognized in the random objects on the planet, which in a sense gives us, like creates a perfect loop of meaning. Uh, this is all these things that are recognized on Mars. Uh, to iguanas for some reason. And, and the family. Uh, and um, and this it just shows you the limit in a way of human uh, human fantasy <laughs> that this is what they find on Mars. Um, and this is um, this is a sort of installation that I did where I combined the animal form with the robotic form and made a sort of um, um, my own. A set design for Mars potentiality, um, and these are just, I'm just and these are basically the sculptures that I have in the back. But I'm going to show you them as images, where the nature element, the Mars element, and the sort of the curve element they combine into this promotional banners for Mars exploration, which I just think I just sort of imagine them, and I think. If, if somebody will start doing it, then why not me make the first sort of example? So yeah, this is it, I think. Thank you so much for your attention.